OK, well, as we hit the noon hour, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to the March 18th version of our weekly COVID-19 situation report. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Grateful to have so many guests here with us today. And uh, I will now um, uh, move along to, if I can just remember how to do it, there we go, to our land acknowledgement as we um, are so fortunate to call this beautiful place home and share it with um, all of our partners and our communities. We respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagic and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Okay. So with that, I will now uh, invite uh, our Board of Health Chair, Mayor Andy Mitchell from Selwyn Township to begin with some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Andy. Thank you, Brittany. The battle against COVID-19 remains an ongoing struggle. We continue to experience new cases almost every day. Our region remains in a high alert status, red, and this week we experienced another tragic death. Just yesterday, we declared an outbreak in our community shelter system. But this week also saw, saw us continue and expand our offensive, a vigorous rollout of vaccine. All our residents in long-term care have now been vaccinated twice. Residents of all our retirement homes and other senior congregate living facilities have been vaccinated once. Our patient-facing health care workers have been largely vaccinated. Clinics have been held at both Curve Lake and Hiawatha First Nations, and our urban-based Indigenous populations have been vaccinated. Today, we begin concluding Phase 1 rollout. Over the next several days, we intend to vaccinate those seniors 80 and over who are living independently. Clinics are being hosted in both the city and the county. Also, we are piloting the distribution of AstraZeneca to those aged 60 to 64 through our primary care providers. Soon, we will begin phase two. People between the ages of 60 and 79 will be eligible, as well as those not able to work from home. More details will soon follow. Our success in, in accomplishing this, max this mass vaccination effort is the result of unprecedented cooperation between all levels of government and the spirit of volunteerism among our healthcare professionals supporting organization, and residents of our community. To all of you, thank you. Remember, getting vaccinated when your time comes not only protects you, but also your family and the community at large. Stay safe, be well, and in all things, be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Mitchell, and for so eloquently capturing the complexity of the COVID response that we're in the midst of right now and the importance of diligence. Uh, so now I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Rosanna Salvatera to walk us through uh, the latest statistics. So please go ahead, Dr. Salvatera. Great. Thanks, Brittany. So I'll start with a situational update. As of 4.30 p.m. yesterday, uh, there were 55 active cases which is 26 cases fewer than reported last Thursday. Our total case count stands at 787 cases to date. There also have been an additional 37 cases that are variants of concern that have been reported to us this past week, bringing the total number to 126 presumed variants of concern. The number of high risk close contacts that we are following has declined considerably to 143, which is 77 fewer than this time than this time last week. Sadly, we reported earlier in the week the local death count has increased to 10. Next slide, please. Uh, 
The weekly case count is showing a favorable trend downward. For the week of March 8, there were 48 new cases reported. And so far this week, there are 20 cases reported. Next slide, please. Here you can see that March has overtaken February for total cases reported in a month. And uh, remembering that we are only halfway through this month. Next slide, please. We'll look at exposures now. The cumulative number of exposures linked to the high risk contacts continues to increase and now stands at 77%. This number is even higher when you look at our last four weeks, uh, where more than 80% of our cases were exposed through high-risk contacts already identified by our team here at PPH. Next slide, please. On testing, there continues to be lots of activity in our community with 750 more new people being tested last week, bringing our total to 45,250 local residents who've been tested at least once. I would like to thank our local paramedics for their support of surveillance testing at some of the outbreak sites over the past few weeks. So let's take a look at our outbreaks. We now have three active outbreaks in our community. The Severn Court outbreak has 59 associated cases in those buildings as of this morning. Only four of those cases are currently active. The Champlain College outbreak at Trent University has nine cases linked to it with only one active case at the moment. All cases for both of these student resident outbreaks have also screened positive for variants of concern. And these facilities remain under a Section 22 order. A new outbreak at the Brock Mission, as you've heard, uh, has been declared earlier this week. And this was done as a result of one case there who is currently in self-isolation. The Regency Retirement Home Outbreak was declared over last week. Next slide, please. Here you can see our weekly case incidence rate has dropped in half down to 23 cases per 100,000. That's down from 46 cases per 100,000 reported last week. Next slide, please. And here are the assigned color zones for each reason, sorry, with each region, with Peterborough remaining in the red zone for now. You may have heard that earlier today, Ottawa has announced that they are moving into red tomorrow morning. Next slide, please. Thanks to the efforts of provincial and local partners led by Professor Christopher Kyle and his team at Trent University, we now have data from wastewater surveillance to add to our sources of information on the status of the COVID outbreak in our community. Samples are being taken three times a week from the wastewater treatment plant here in the city. And Professor Kyle's team is testing for the presence of the coronavirus genetic material. Recent results from wastewater testing are depicted by the bar graphs on this slide. And what we've done is we've overlaid in red our daily case counts. So you can see that there appears to be a, a match between what we're picking up in the water, in the wastewater, and what we are seeing in human cases here uh, in Peterborough. So this data can provide us with both an early warning of increased infections in our community, as well as another way to validate what we are finding from testing of symptomatic individuals and their contacts. So on a going forward basis, we will be incorporating these data into our overall surveillance. So I'd like to move on with some other remarks. Uh, it certainly has been an exciting week for us and our community as we mark the first week of the provincial vaccination appointment booking system. I must admit it was a little bumpy at first as the province worked out some of the kinks to the online booking portal. 
We also experienced some local technical challenges Monday morning that required a quick pivot to get our local call center back up and running. However, since that initial surge, call volumes have leveled off, and I'm pleased to report that so far, 3,240 appointments have been booked into our three local clinics. We are extremely grateful for the city and county of Peterborough for the support of their staff serving as our local call center agents. So far, they have fielded thousands of calls and have fully booked our Evan Rood Center Clinic. Space is still available in the Norwood Clinic and at the PRHC Clinic. We've got good sight lines now on future vaccine supply into the, the next couple of weeks. So more clinics will be announced as soon as we are ready to start administering vaccine to eligible residents in uh, phase two. So here again is a chart uh, showing how phase two is expected to progress. Uh, we expect to be vaccinating people in their 70s in April and people in their 60s in May. Also individuals with specific health conditions and caregivers in congregate uh, settings will be vaccinated concurrently. By June, we hope to start vaccinating those who cannot work from home. If you would like to be notified when your particular group becomes eligible in phase two, my team is creating a very simple online form where you can sign up and then we will notify you by emails. De details of this will be announced shortly. We're also getting a lot of questions about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Earlier this week, our National Advisory Committee on Immunization updated its recommendations based on some recent trials that have included people in their 70s and their 80s. And these trials found that the vaccine was protective. So based on that, NACI is now recommending AstraZeneca for all adults over the age of 18 years. And I do anticipate that this will lead to provincial changes as well. In the meantime, our primary care pilots are now underway and we look forward to seeing a significant portion of our 60 to 64 year olds here in Peterborough immunized by April 2nd. So I'll turn it back over to you, Brittany. Thank you very much, Dr. Salvatera. Uh, so now we have an opportunity to hear from our elected officials, and I, I see that Chief Carr has been able to join us today. Uh, did you have any uh, comments you wish to share today, Chief Carr, or would you just like to be available for questions? Hi, Brittany, and good afternoon, everyone. I do have a uh, just a couple of uh, comments I'd like to share, and first um, to uh, the to the young man that passed away and to his family and and, and um, school community. Um, I just wanted to send our heartfelt um, thoughts and prayers from Hiawatha First Nation and um, to know that um, we did we did lay down our tobacco and say prayers for this young man and for, for all the community. Uh, the second piece I would like to touch on is um, the public health. Of course, I always give thanks to everyone. I'm, everyone is is on this journey together. We're all on this journey together, and everyone is doing their part in in relation to their community and and the work that they do. However, I do want to give um, a great thank you to uh, Dr. Salvatera and public health and all the volunteers that have been working in the clinics. We did have our clinic on the weekend and I was there on Sunday uh, volunteering for my community. And then I went Monday, we had some, myself and our health manager went Monday to help at the Urban Indigenous Clinic. And uh, some of those staff had been going seven and 10 days straight. So. I just really had to acknowledge from my heart and my community um, to those workers that continuously go to to make our whole 
community safe or work towards making our greater community safe. So chi miigwech to all of you. It's it's amazing what you're doing. And from Hiawatha and myself, I'm so grateful. Miigwech. Thank you very much, Chief Carr, and, and thank you for, for volunteering and supporting the, the clinics. It's, it's great to have uh, the community coming together in that way. Okay, so now uh, we will um, invite our uh, media partners to uh, to ask the questions, and um, I'm going to invite Mark Junta from Global News to kick us off. So go ahead, Mark. Yes, uh, good uh, good afternoon. I'm just wondering, uh, with the case counts now dropping at uh, at seven, uh, you think it was four active? Just how close are we to lifting the outbreak there? Uh, well, we'll need to uh, ensure, we, we typically wait at least one incubation period and a little bit longer to allow for testing before we would declare the outbreak over. So uh, we might be able to have some news as to when that might be uh, at our next uh, media scrum next week. And just on that as well, uh, I know I ask this question, I think every week, but just uh, how much closer are we to really knowing how big this this got uh, in terms of the community spread? Sorry, Mark, you cut out there. I just heard how big this got and then uh, I lost you. Yeah, sorry about that. Just uh, in terms of the the outbreak, I, I pretty much ask it every week, but just how much closer are we to uh, to knowing just how big it got in terms of the community impact for spread? Well, we're going to have to get our epi team to actually try and show that. And they, I know it's a lot of work, uh, but uh, we can do uh, sort of an overall analysis of the all of the many linkages to that one outbreak. It's quite extensive. I mean, many of our cases, not all, but many of our cases in the community have been linked in one way or another, uh, either as a secondary case or potentially as a household contact of a secondary case. So we'll uh, work on getting that ready so that we can share that with the community. I know police uh, and public health have been working kind of together on the investigation. I'm just wondering if the death changes anything in terms of the investigation and, and how it's approached. It, it doesn't change anything for us. Uh, we continue to work with cases and uh, with contacts. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, it, this was a major setback for us as far as just uh, the tragedy and uh, it impacted uh, many of our staff had come to know the particular individual. And uh, and so this really uh, was felt very deeply by all of us here uh, at Peterborough Public Health. Um, I also I had a chance to speak with a family member and uh, and uh, it, it it has been heartbreaking to lose someone so young. For sure, I don't know if uh, if anyone else is on the call, like police or anything like that. But I wonder if uh, if they could answer uh, the same thing if uh, if the investigation changes at all with um, with the fact now there's been a death. Chief Gilbert here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm just going to put you on spotlight. Go ahead, Chief Gilbert. Thank well, you. First, I'm just going to start by uh, uh, saying that the investigation into the Severn Court outbreak is ongoing, and uh, we do understand that there's a great public demand for a conclusion, a speedy conclusion to the investigation into this incident, which resulted in 59 direct cases of COVID-19. And unfortunately, earlier this week, the death of a student, which was the worst possible outcome. Uh, at Peterborough Police Service, we were very saddened to hear of the passing of the student, and our thoughts are with his family and friends during this extremely difficult time. The investigation is very important. It needs to be recognized that there's an added layer of intricacy in this, as it is happening, uh, and it, it does involve a lot of close work with Peterborough Public Health, who are working very hard to not only contain the outbreak in a pandemic, but also prevent further harm in our communities. That being said, Peterborough Public Health and Peterborough Police have two independent investigations to do. And I learned uh, through the media that uh, 
Fleming College is also going to be doing their own independent investigation. So as we continue to move through the investigative process after being brought into the fold on March 3rd, uh, this process includes gathering information and evidence to support any potential charges, along with working with enforcement officials at Peterborough Public Health. However, there is also a great deal of health information involved and the privacy issues that arise around that information. So the process is taking more time and is going to recover, require on our part uh, probably production orders and potentially search warrants to obtain all of the necessary information. And as soon as we're able, we'll, we will provide an update into the investigation. As with all of our investigations, Mark, uh, we do consult with Crown attorneys. Right now, uh, you know, we were approaching this investigation as a uh, Provincial Offences Act breach under the uh, Reopening of Ontario Act. And still we're going to be consulting with crown attorneys in relation to search warrants and the legality around any any issues that we that might arise around production orders or search warrants should we go down that path that being said as well crown attorneys will be consulted in case uh, evidence uh, does lead us in a direction where uh, potentially there is something more than a provincial offenses act breach but I, I can't say what the future is going to hold. The investigation is ongoing and uh, we'll see where it takes us. In the meantime, though, I would ask that people continue to follow what public health guidelines and what public health are telling them. Uh, the Severn Court outbreak, by all accounts so far, was a needless and avoidable tragedy that people simply had to follow the rules and not put their own selfish needs and wants ahead of the greater good of the community. And again, I can't stress enough, and we've been saying this all along for a year now, follow what public health is telling you. There's a reason for it, and it's it's to keep us all safe. So please follow what public health tells you. I'm just wondering, has there been any charges laid so far in, in this investigation? No, there have not. Okay, and then... Uh, in terms of the uh, the investigation and, and kind of going forward, um, well, we've been hearing on calls uh, through the weeks that police are getting all sorts of different information from people there, and it's essentially throwing the investigation off. Could charges not be laid for obstructing an investigation for those that are giving you false information, trying to throw you off? I'm not going to speculate on that, Mark. There's a, a variety of things that could take place from an investigation. And we'll just see where the uh, where the trail leads us. And as I said, we'll consult with uh, Crown Attorney where necessary, and and see if what charges, if any, are appropriate. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Gilbert and and Mark for those questions. Um, okay, so let's um, move on to our next. Um, reporter and I see uh, Matt Latour is on the line. So if you've got some questions for Dr. Salvatera, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, my first question for Dr. Salvatera, I see there's a petition going around online from a couple of restaurants uh, that are calling for people allowed to be in restaurants to be based on the restaurant's capacity and not a solid number of 10. Is this something that uh, you've seen or can I get your thoughts on this and whether or not you think it's uh, feasible? Well, we are following the restrictions that are associated with the red zone, and that's one of the restrictions, uh, uh, and, and Paul, that is that there is a maximum capacity of 10 allowed uh, in a bar or a restaurant. I have no intention on changing that. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you, Matt. Um, okay, Paul Rellinger from Kawartha Now. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Brittany. Um, for Dr. Salvadera, and then if I could, a question for uh, Chief Gilbert. Um, the 23 per 100,000 number you mentioned, uh, a very positive number, obviously. Um, I just wanna get a clarification. Um, assuming this week and it's probably not a good idea to make an assumption stays under 40 cases and that would be the case again say next week would that be 
a good thing in terms of moving us to yellow potentially? Because I understand 40 is that threshold number, correct? It's the threshold for uh, orange to red. Oh, All orange. I meant to say orange, yes. Sorry. And my apologies. I called Matt Paul, so I want to apologize for that. <laughs> uh, so it is the threshold for orange. Okay, so, so, uh, okay, so, all right, that answers that question. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you also about the presumed VOC cases. Uh, you've had on the dashboard the number of one as confirmed cases for quite a while. That hasn't changed. And I'm just wondering what, if, if there's a reason for the, any delay in uh, that number from presumed being confirmed or because because there really hasn't been a lot of movement there. No, and in fact, I think what we're seeing in the province, Paul, is that there's been such an increase in the uh, variance of concern. Uh, potentially that explains the delay in their genetic sequencing results, but there is now going to be a change in the way the province is testing for variance of concern. So the testing that's been done as a screening is going to remain, but they're going to add one other uh, a receptor to that testing. Uh, and between these two screening tests, uh, they will be able to determine pretty with, with a great deal of confidence which of the variants of concern uh, we're dealing with. So uh, we're in the midst now of that changing. So the, the backstory to that reporting is, is shifting. Um, and then in addition to that, the province will continue just to, to do a 5% of all positive cases. They will continue to genetically uh, sequence those. So I'm not not anticipating that we are potentially going to get many more confirmations as we shift to this new uh, new way of detecting, identifying variants of concern. If anything, we will just move all of those presumed, move them over to the B117 bucket, which uh, you may uh, recognize as being what was formerly called the UK variant. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Salvatera. Um, and if I could for Chief Gilbert, um, I heard the explanation. It was a great explanation you gave to Mark uh, regarding the um, investigation at Severn Court. I just wanted to get a clarification on something. Um, since the tragic death this week, does that potentially change the outcome in terms of what charges could potentially be laid uh, in relation to the party, if any? Well, like I said to what, like I said to Mark, I'm not going to speculate on what the outcome of the investigation is going to be or what the potential for charges could be if any charges are in fact laid. Uh, that's something we will consult with the Crown Attorney on and see what uh, what we need to do, if anything. Okay, great, I, and thank you. I, that I I might have missed that, so I apologize. But thank you. Yep, no, no problem. Thank no you, problem. Chief Gilbert, and thank you, Brittany. That's all I have. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, let's hear from Bill Hodgins, who's joining us from uh, mycoortha.com. So if you've got some questions, Bill, please go ahead. Hello. Oh, hello, we hear you. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I'm just... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the number of eligible people to be vaccinated. Um, whether they be healthcare workers or first nations and such, um, maybe a, a percentage that have refused it or decided not to. Do you have anything like that? Um, we certainly will at the when when we are a little further along. Um, because people remain eligible once they've been identified, they have more than just a day or two or a week or two to be immunized. So they have they have time to be immunized. And so going forward, once we get a little more time there, we'll have a better sense of what proportion of people who were invited ever did come and get both their first dose. So we'll know how many had their first dose and of those, how many went on to get their second dose. So I think it's just a little too soon for us to be making that kind of an analysis. All right, thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, so uh, I see Trent Radio is joining us today. If, is that Rob? If you've got some questions, go ahead, Rob. Hi, uh, yes, it is, but uh, no questions for me today. Thank you. Okay, um, then we've got uh, Greg Davis on the line from from Global. Did you have any further questions for beyond Marks? Oh, unless Greg has since left when I found him. I think he's no longer on. So, okay, my apologies. Uh, then I'm going to um, move on to Reg Watson, who is here from the examiner. Any questions for us today, Reg? Have any charges been laid against businesses or workplaces over the last few weeks now that we've moved to the red zone under the various laws? Hmm. That's a great question. I don't know if Julie is on this uh, call with us. Julie uh, Ingram, our manager. No, so we're going to have to ask Julie and get back to you on that one from our perspective. Perhaps the police can tell you whether they've laid any charges. I, I could direct that to Chief Gilbert if he could answer. I'm aware that uh, we had a protest last Saturday. And one charge was laid uh, in relation to uh, that particular event, not social distancing and wearing a mask outside City Hall. I'm not aware of any other, uh, actually, sorry, a correction. I am aware that we are laying charges in relation to a house party that took place where there was uh, obviously the homeowners were present with uh, 13 or 14 uh teenagers who weren't residents of that home most of them were not residents of that home so charges i'm told are being laid in that case and when would that party have been it was this past weekend also one follow-up question there's been a lot of chatter on social media where people seem to have an expectation that a manslaughter charge could be laid in the severed court and i wonder if you could comment on the likelihood of it ever getting to that point well like i i've said uh, twice before we have to see what evidence unfolds see the direction that the investigation takes and uh, and consult with uh, a crown attorney I think the threshold for manslaughter is quite high and uh, you know, quite honestly I don't uh, see that but I don't have a law degree so we would be consulting with the Crown Attorney and see what charges are appropriate if any at all. Okay thank you. Okay and I just want to say that you know there's a lot of people that speculate on social media about a lot of stuff and I just ask for some patience and and just let us do our investigation without all the added uh, uh, layers of uh, conspiracy, et cetera, because that really is not doing any good. Uh, you know, you've got uh, Peterborough Public Health that are trying to do a really important contact tracing investigation to prevent the spread, contain the spread. And if people are afraid of, you know, really, really serious repercussions about people rumor mongering about manslaughter or murder or whatever that's not going to help peterborough public health keep the rest of us safe because people aren't going to want to share information with them unknown caller thank you for thank that. you very much any further questions reg oh uh, no thanks oh actually actually to um to Brittany, are there any updated numbers yet on the number of vaccinations for the past week and on numbers specifically on how many have received two doses. Uh, we're not reporting on um, how many have received two doses, but we are able to um, report on the total number of doses that have been administered. So that will be updated on our website before the end of the day. Um, and yeah, so I don't have the, that information uh, with me right now. I think it's still being calculated, but it will be updated on our website before the end of the day. Okay, thanks. We'll watch for that. That's all my questions. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think that uh, brings us to the end.
And uh, just a few reminders for our um, media guests that um, I hope many of you are able to join us for the media preview of the of the Evanrude Clinic that's taking place this afternoon at 3.30. Uh, we, we did send some information out about that earlier in the week, but this is not your opportunity to get some visuals, uh, you know, photographs and uh, video footage of the clinic. And we'll have our staff down there to, to take you on a quick tour. Um, and I also would like to remind everyone on the line that this evening at 6.30, Dr. Salvatera is giving a uh, webinar on the two latest vaccines that have been approved, the AstraZeneca and the Janssen vaccine. That will also be recorded and available on our YouTube channel after the fact if you do miss it, but it is a chance for the community to ask their questions and, and to hear Dr. Salvatera's latest information. Uh, and also keep an eye open for a release coming from Trent University with regard to the wastewater surveillance project. Project, uh, that Dr. Salvatera mentioned earlier today. So thank you again. Uh, appreciate your questions and your, your participation and uh, stay safe out there and we'll connect with you next Thursday. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you.